I'm sitting here with one of the biggest evidence-based fitness YouTubers in the current social media age, Jeff Nippert. Today, I'll be asking you five questions about five different topics where I want you to give your best take on what the research says and what trainees should be doing in their training for muscle building and cite one paper, break it down and explain why it supports your stats. All right. First off, let's talk about training to failure for muscle building. Do you think trainees should be training to failure to build muscle? And what research are you basing that recommendation off? So yes, I, I think people need to train to failure to maximize muscle growth. I don't think you need to train to failure to stimulate muscle growth. That's pretty clear. Um, but if, if your goal is becoming as jacked as possible, I think if you never train to failure, you won't be able to do it. <clears throat> and I think the main reason for that is if you've never trained to failure, you're not going to know what one to three reps in reserve actually feels like. And I think it's not enough to just like do that once or twice. I think you need to like regularly remind yourself, especially as you get stronger. To support the idea that failure is important, I would do um, Robinson et al. 2023, the meta-analysis. In the original print of that study, you saw what looked almost like exponential growth as you got closer to failure. But I think they tweaked the data a bit, released another graph where you still see like a slight increase towards as you get closer, like more muscle growth as you get closer to failure. But it's not nearly like the same slope as it was in the original release. Uh, so that tells us that you at least need to be close to failure if your goal is maximum muscle growth. The reason I'm not saying you have to go to failure, though, mm -hmm. is, um, is it Raffello? Am I saying that Raffello, right? Yeah. Raffello, Raffello, yeah. So their latest paper from this year in experienced subjects yep. actually found no difference between failure versus, I think it was like one to three reps in reserve uh, in the quads. Yep. And so... That's actually, I think, a really strong study because it was experienced trainees and it pretty conclusively showed that yep. like you can still maximize gains, at least in the time period that the study lasted for, leaving some reps in the tank. Sure. So do you think you would prioritize training closer to failure over doing more volume? Like how do you yeah. see the fatigue trade off there? I actually would. I, I think I think effort matters more than volume. And I think that volume is more of an individual thing. I think that you like in the, the we could say that from anecdote as much as anything else that like some people just seem to do really well with lower volume. Some people seem to do well blasting high volumes. Yeah. And but the, the commonality that everyone needs to do is train hard. Awesome. That was a solid answer for the next topic. Let's move on to training volume. OK, so. How many sets do you think the average trainee should be doing to build muscle? And what research do you typically rely on? Like low volume versus high volume. What do you typically recommend? I recommend more of like a moderate volume for most people. And that's probably because I think most people are in that like intermediate to advanced zone, at least in my audience. Um, so for me, I generally will say like something in the ballpark of around 10 sets per muscle per week to maximize growth. And as you get more advanced, you can probably go higher like so you could go 10 to 20 especially for certain muscles yep. like the back for example can probably take a lot the glutes can probably take a lot sure um and so depending on how advanced you are and depending on how much time you have to train you could probably go as high as like even 30 sets per muscle per week for certain body parts or maybe even higher than that but like for the most part no i'm somewhere in the ballpark of like 10 sets per week um for a reference for that i i would probably go with like uh the, the krieger meta-analysis okay. from the Several years one. back, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, where basically you did see growth. I forget the exact numbers, but it's something like you see growth up until around like eight sets per muscle per week, I think, and then it just starts to taper off from there. Yep. Um, and so that's where I come up with like around the 10 sets figure, because I would imagine that subjects in those studies were probably less advanced than like the average person in my audience. You have a little bit of a buffer. Combine that with some of the like most recent research. Um, I forget the lead author, but the 52 set study. Yes, and us. Yeah, and it's right. The upper threshold to continue to make progress is probably higher than that eight set figure. But I think that that gives us like a starting place of where like, no, going up to that point yeah. will get you more gains. Going past it may or may not. Sure. Okay. And how would you distribute that across the week? Like how many sessions would you do per week per muscle? Is this another question? No, it's just like a... Okay. Like um, so uh, I think practically speaking, you want at least two, yeah. because I think if you're just to throw it all in one workout, you would just see performance drop off toward the end of the Correct. session. Um, but you could in theory do it in one session. Like I know a lot of really big IFBB pros prefer to do it in one session. So you probably could do that, but I generally would recommend at least splitting it up into two. And if you do need a lot of volume, like if you get to the, re let's say I'm really advanced and I just really want to hammer my biceps, like you could do it four or five days a week. You could just really split it all up. So, so there's a ton of flexibility there. Higher volumes, higher frequencies, yeah. but if you're pretty low in volume, you can go lower as well. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. 
Next up, a very relevant one. Okay. For hypertrophy, mm -hmm. full range of motion or length in partials? Wolf it out. 2023. All right, 2024. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah. So wait, what, what was it? Full range, range of motion or length and partials for building partials? muscle? What would you recommend most broadly? Oh man, you're putting me on the spot here. I would say, uh, general fitness audience, I would probably still say like something like full range of motion, but make sure you can feel a deep stretch. So I, I guess I would combine the two. I don't personally think that the evidence is strong enough to recommend length and partials across the board. So and there's a slight communication problem with length and partials where I don't think people have like an easy time imagining what that looks like or what they should do, especially on different exercises. Whereas with full range of motion, you're going to get the lengthened aspect. Yep. So it's like an easier default recommendation. Sure. But if I'm speaking for like, if I've got more than just like a single elevator ride to talk to someone, yep. I'd probably explain that like the lengthened aspect seems to be more important. So like make sure that you're at least getting there if you get to the end of the set and you can crank out a few more in that length and aspect, that might be better still, something like that. Let's talk about bulking and cutting okay. versus quote unquote main gaming. Yeah. Currently, do you think the research supports if someone wanted to maximize their muscle building long-term over their career as a lifter? Mm -hmm. Would you recommend they do aggressive bulking and cutting or would you recommend, provided they're relatively lean to begin with, getting more so into a moderate surplus and slowly gaining weight over their lifting career? Which would be a recommendation as far as bulking goes? If they're starting out lean? Yeah. See, I, I would probably go somewhere in the middle. So I think, I think you can be too passive with your bulking to the point that like you kind of do just end up spinning your wheels and not like making as quick of gains as you otherwise could. Um, but I don't think I would recommend like really aggressive bulk cut cycles. Yeah. Reference for that would be uh, Garth Adal, 2013. In a moderate surplus, they see X amount of muscle gain. If you put them in a huge surplus, you still see X amount of muscle gain, gain, but you see way more fat gain. And so the big surpluses just don't tend to translate to more muscle gain. You only need seemingly a small surplus yep. to build muscle. With that said, I think that if you're training really hard, you're eating enough protein, and you're already a lean person, yep. you can probably get away with a decent surplus, and you're probably not going to get like accumulate a lot of fat so it does depend on the individual but in the example you gave with the lean person i'd almost say like yeah you know maybe you could go to a 15 to 20 percent surplus and be fine even though the ev the latest evidence might suggest a five to ten percent surplus five, is really all you yeah. need okay would you tailor that well two questions one how much weight gain would that be per month roughly and two would you tailor it to beginner intermediate advanced differently good question um so I would say something in the ballpark of like, does this make sense? Like 0.5 to 1% yep. of body weight per month. Perfect. Um, yeah. And if it's beginner versus intermediate, I would probably, I, I, I don't know if I, I don't know if I would, to be honest with you. Like it, it, for me, this is like a, this is like a, a question of like art more than science. Like yep. it's, it's, it's a coaching question. Like what does it, is the person really scared to gain fat? If so, then yeah, I'm going to put them in a more moderate surplus, whether they're beginning, beginner, intermediate or advanced. Yep. I think you could make the case that as a beginner, you want, you, you could get away with a bigger surplus because you're more primed for fast muscle growth. So like I'd probably skew if you're a beginner lifter who's not super scared of fat gain, then yes, I'm going to put you in a bigger surplus than an advanced lifter who is scared of fat gain. Sure. But with that said, you could also flip it and say, well, if you're more advanced, you're closer to your genetic ceiling, so you need more surplus to actually drive that growth. Yep. So it really depends on the person. But on average, you wouldn't like categorically give less of a surplus to an advanced training versus like a beginner. I don't You'd think so. I think it would. It by case by I case. think it would take it case by case because, like I said, if the beginner, if the advanced person is, if I think that they've been training optimally and they're really closer to their genetic ceiling, I actually think that an aggressive surplus could be exactly what they need to drive new gains. Yeah. And if they're chill with a bit of fat gain, then great. Uh, and likewise, uh, with a beginner, I could say, well, you're the most prime you'll ever be for muscle growth. Let's just YOLO it yeah, with this yeah. surplus, you know. Um, but if they're a right beginner and they're like, well, I want to see a bit of recomp and, you know, I'm a little, you know, I don't want to gain any fat, then no, I'm going to put them in a small surplus. So I don't think I, I don't think I would scale it that different beginner to advanced, even though the weight, the actual rate of muscle gain recommendations would, of course, go down as you get more advanced. Awesome. And I respect the Garth citation as that's like the, the seminal study, you yeah. know, on bulking. Yeah. Final question is what does nutrition science have to say about the effect of protein distribution across the day? 
Oh. Do you think there's an optimal frequency of like oh. uh, four meals a day or two or one? Is there, what's your general take on how many protein feedings you should have per day? These are good questions, bro. Yes, well. um, so a couple of years ago, I would have said, I think at least three to five meals is what you should aim for to maximize muscle protein synthesis across the day. My sedation for that would have been Philips et al. 2011, I think. Uh, yeah. And they, they had the like the bolus versus the intermediate yep, the versus classic. the pulse. Yeah, and eight that was, times 10 grams. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, but since then, Tromlin et al. 2023 came out with the uh, the barbecue study where they gave people uh, a, you know a massive amount of, of protein. I think it was like 100 grams or something in one sitting and saw similar net protein balance, I think was the yeah. uh, what they measured. So a, in essence, maybe that earlier acute research doesn't actually matter as much as we thought. Now, with that said, I still actually wouldn't put all that much stock in the trauma one study because it's not a long-term hypertrophy study. I'd like to see a long-term hypertrophy study where one group eats all their protein in one meal, one group spaces it across, let's say three or four meals, and let's actually measure the hypertrophy difference. That's actually a study I'd love to do. Yeah. Um, until we have that, I'm actually still going to hedge my bets toward three meals being slightly better because I think there is a mechanistic case for it. But what the trauma study has shown is that if you do miss a meal, as long as you can get your protein in by the end of the day, you're going to be fine. Yeah. Do you kind of see it like frequency, where frequency across the week doesn't seem to play that big of a role for hypertrophy? As long as you get the same sort of training volume and training to failure, et cetera. Kind of. It depends on the context, though, because I think that frequency can be a tool that you use mm. to actually maximize muscle growth, even though if I'm just speaking to like the average intermediate, I think you can have all the flexibility that you want with frequency. Yeah. The more advanced you get, the more you can use frequency as a tool to spark new muscle growth. I would say almost a similar thing with the protein, where if you're in that intermediate category, you're busy, training isn't the most important thing in your life, sure, just hit your daily protein target. Don't worry about the other stuff. You're going to be fine. As you get more advanced or if you have more ambitious goals, I would still recommend trying to get at least three meals in. And I do have some studies that support that, but I don't know the author. Yeah, with protein feeding, it's, it's tricky, right? Because we have a lot of acute data on like MPS and what have you. But as far as longitudinal research comparing different frequencies, we have remarkably little. Yeah. And whatever studies we do have often aren't in the context of lifting. When they are, oftentimes they find no differences between like one meal a day and two or three or what have you. So it's a pretty difficult, difficult question to answer. But I agree with you that mechanistically, if anything, there is research support. All right. Three or more. I'm going to ask you a question. Hell yeah. But I have to think of it first. When he talking? My name is Jeff. My name is Jeff. And I'm a muscle nerd. And I want to do everything possible to maximize my gains. Uh -huh. What is the best periodization scheme that I should use? Daily undulating. Yeah? Yeah, because like, if you look into the strict definitions of different periodization styles, with linear, for example, you'd be doing the same session throughout the week repeatedly. Daily undulating, there is a theoretical benefit to combining different rep ranges. So, for example, there was an in-house meta-analysis by Zach Robinson. He hasn't published it, but there, he has done meta-analysis on all the studies that combine different rep ranges versus only use one mm -hmm. across the week, and has found a slight hypertrophy benefit to using different rep ranges across the week for a given muscle. And daily undulating periodization involves manipulation of rep range, number of sets, um, exercises, et cetera, across the week. So that would allow you to get that benefit. Additionally, you get the benefit of exercise variation, where we have a meta-analysis by uh, Nunes and colleagues on exercise variation and its effect on hypertrophy, like using one exercise for a given muscle versus using, say, like two to four. Mm -hmm. And we also see better, more homogenous hypertrophy across the muscle using a variety of exercises. Mm -hmm. So daily, daily undul undulating periodization in this context would be, say you're training twice a week. Yep. On one day you do six to eight reps. On the other day you do 12 to 15 reps. Correct. There's your DUP. Just like in your per hypertrophy program, you know, with I, different differences uh, in rep ranges across uh, the week. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> um, it's such a wide definition. Like yeah, exactly. Pretty much every program falls under daily undulating. True. At this point, what I wouldn't say is I don't think there's a strong rationale for adding volume week to week. Okay. Like, you know how people, some people make the claim that, oh, you should be adding volume week to week and then deload and repeat and, you know, like a phasic yeah. structure. I don't know that we have the evidence for that. Sure. And I think it's quite impractical usually, like adding sets every week. I would rather someone have a good amount of volume yeah. that gets them a good amount of hypertrophy and just stay at that level. Yeah. Unless they find they have more time for more volume or what have you. Yeah. But I, but you would still add either a rep or some weight from... Oh, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, that's like progressive overload. Yeah. And for my citation, 
I would say, fuck. <laughs> I know. I know, I, was, I know there's two meta analyses on the topic, but I don't remember the author names of either one. Bro, you know. Do you know? I think so. I don't know. I could be wrong, but like, doesn't Zordos? Like, can you just throw a Zordos? I mean, Zordos has done some studies on it, but I'm Maybe looking for the meta analysis. Uh, you feel me? Oh, the meta analysis. I would. There's know. been two. I know. I and could, both of them have found no effect. There's also the be. you could you could also say this is a throwback, but you could go John Kiley. Do you That's know that true. paper? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's true. it's not a good it's not a meta analysis, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's a really it's a nice like paper uh, of paper. Yeah, yeah, and it basically I think was the first one to show that like periodization really just comes down to variation. Yeah. Which is why, which is which is why, kind of what you said, right? Yeah. In the same vein, though, since we're talking about periodization now, I think that um, people often argue for novelty being this huge thing. Mm. I'm not sure that I believe novelty is that big of a thing. True. Like, uh, really? Like honestly, so if you think that novelty is why beginners see a ton of growth, I guess that's one definition of novelty. But personally, I think that novelty is an argument like, oh, you need to change exercises every three months to see more growth. I don't know that we have the research for that. You know. Like, do you see a case for changing exercises every three to six weeks or 12 weeks? What have you? I can make a case for it. Okay. I don't know if it would necessarily be evidence-based. Yeah. But, like, I think people just get bored with the same Oh, program. I agree. So, that's, like, yeah. and boredom sure. is terrible for adherence. So, for sure. there you go. Um, that's that's, that's about as good as I could get. Boom. <laughs> All right. All right, that was great. That wraps up the questions. I would say, honestly, man, that was 10 out of 10. You've passed the influencer test. Let's oh. go. We're in the lab. Thank doing you. science now. Um, yeah, pleasure having you, and we'll see you in the next video. Peace.